Welcome to another episode of the Creative Power Hour. I'm your host, Marcus Whitney, and today our guest is the captivating Cameo Carlson. What's up, bud? Good, I like that. Thank you. You just follow me around and like call me captivating. Yeah, and then like Des can do the superhero music. Yes, he's got a pretty mean beatbox. I like that. (laughs) Cameo, thank you for doing the show. Of course, good to see you. You too. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You can say that until you haven't seen somebody, right? Like even if it's April or May. Okay, you can. You can. It's a reminder that we haven't seen each other. Probably should do better. Which is ridiculous on that front. Um, But I know you've been busy. I have been busy. Yeah. I've been uh, working hard. Yeah, you're doing a good job. Thank you. We're going to talk about that. Okay. But first, origin story. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's an interesting one because I don't really know where to start. Um, I feel like everyone's origin story starts with home, and that's kind of a weird concept for me. We didn't have the, you know, we don't have the family home where you go back every holiday and it was a thing. My dad, when I was really, really young, was in the Navy, and we moved around quite a bit. But he was out of the Navy by the time I was maybe seven, okay. six or seven. I think my parents liked moving. And so we still <laughs> moved every couple of years. And so it was a lot of, um, you know, forced to make friends. And even if you're shy, you have to kind of get over it. And a lot of that kind of stuff. But we moved around a lot. We, we lived in the Northeast. We lived in California. We lived in El Paso. We lived in Coralville, Iowa, all over the place. And, and um, when I was... 13, we ended up in Joplin, Missouri, and we were moving there from Los Angeles. And the, the, the big thing was the timing Dude. of it, right? Oh, I know. It was, it was 13. 13. So it was the worst, most awkward time for anyone anyway. Yes. And for me, it was also, it, w- it was formulated by two main things. One was when my dad came home and told us we were moving to Missouri, I couldn't have told you on the map. I literally right. didn't know where on the map that was. <laughs> we were in Los Angeles at the time. And um, so the two formative things were, I was going to be in one place for high school. That was really the decision that my parents were making. And I was very excited about that. I was excited that we weren't going to be moving around for high school. Okay. So we move. I don't know where this is. All I know is it is like real Bible belty. And I grew up with these. I mean, even though my dad was in the Navy, my parents were super hippies and, you know, pot smoking, like music listening. So I was not prepared for what that was. And we get to Joplin and I, it was, you know, all of that and then some. And it's super religious and. Everyone, it was music. The music was the first thing, though, that I recall as being super formative because I was leaving Stray Cats, Go Go's. All this was happening in the music space, yeah. and at that age, you know, you're so drawn to whatever you're listening oh, to at the time. Thirteen. Oh, God. just everything. Music is like- everything, and it was '84 for me because I'm, you know, that's my age. Yeah. But it was just a really new wave was a thing, and everything was happening, and it was just the beginning of videos yeah. and, and all of that stuff. Of course. So the music was super important to me, and we moved to. To Joplin and I remember the first week of school I was in a science class and they were all talking about um, Quiet Riot and Def Leppard and I just didn't know who those bands were yeah. this was pretty early in wow. the hair metal stages yeah. right yeah, early yeah, yeah. 80s mid 80s and I just thought all of these religious people are all devil worshipers. Like, I don't actually get it. They all listen to this music. Because at the time, that some of that music was, like, scary. Yeah. It deemed scary. Yeah, for sure. And I didn't get I mean, any they, of that. They were popping off the crazy album covers. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. All, pentagrams, pentagrams and all and, of that yeah. stuff. Molly yeah. Crew. Yeah, and, yeah. playing yeah. with people. But, yes, totally. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Right. And most parents didn't know yeah, that, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that was the whole Tipper Gore thing. But, yeah. but I remember thinking... Where are we that we've just moved into this place that I think is really religious? My family's not really religious, and they're all listening to this weird, like, devil music, and I can't find any of my Stray Cats people. Right. And then the other was very traumatic for me, which was Joplin is not a big city, and they found out that a girl had moved in from Los Angeles. So this was going to be like, I was supposed to come in, I think with the long blonde hair and the flowing, you know, whatever. And supposed to be this like LA rock star movie star thing. Yeah. Okay. And I am like the most buck tooth, like have to wear headgear to school, knee socks kind of kid you've ever met. And I wish I was lying. I'm going to give you a picture that you could add to this because I'm not even joking. It's so bad. And so I just remember there being like vocal disappointment when they realized that I was the new girl that had come from Los Angeles and I was such a nerd. 
it just it was it was very traumatizing <laughs> for me and i was in my like brand new jc penny outfit like right. i was feeling it you right. know we were given like a hundred dollars a year to use on jc penny clothes <laughs> on the credit card so i was feeling it and it was not it was not pleasant but joplin was tough that was a really tough transition um for uh, all those reasons and being 13 yeah and my sister at the time was 10 um, so I think maybe a little bit easier for her, but still just, just rough. Yeah. That was a rough and it wasn't, you know, we weren't going to move again. So we actually were planting roots a little bit, which we also weren't sure how to do that very well. Um, so spent a lot of time, uh, just doubling down on school. It's what, it was the only thing that I think being a kid that moved around a lot is that I was real good at the studies because yeah. no matter where we went, that kind of stuff was relatively consistent. Mm-hmm. And so I was always kind of a bookworm and, and, and did all of that. And no matter what my folks were doing, that was a little bit of stability that I could kind of create for myself. So school was always a big deal to me. Also, no one in my family had ever gone to college. So there was a lot of pressure to do college and then my parents had as with any I think first gen kids had it's doctor lawyer you know professional things for sure (laughs) so so there was a lot of pressure to go to school and because I was such a little nerdy kid I mean you know I had the grades I had the scores had all the things and I remember um we didn't have we, we were real broke like we didn't have anything and and when we were in Joplin too I mean I joke about the hundred dollars but that was that was seriously we got a hundred dollars of the JC Penny on the credit card and then I think my parents spent all year paying that off wow yeah. and um we didn't have much but I didn't I think Joplin was the first time I sort of realized that we didn't have much and as we were getting ready for college I definitely felt that mm-hmm. but what wound up happening was um, I got into co- I got into a handful of colleges one of them was full ride for anything in the state of Missouri I could not get out of Missouri fast enough. Yeah, so it just wasn't going to work. No, didn't want to be there. Yeah. And had found this little hippie liberal arts school. And again, because thank, thankfully, my parents would have supported anything I did. But thankfully, because they, they hadn't gone to college, they didn't sort of know the difference between the private liberal arts and the state school. And so right. they were like, sure, whatever, go. Yeah. Um, and I, my financial aid got messed up the first year. And I wound up at the state school for one semester. And hate, it was everything that I knew. It was yeah. gonna be, I just hated it. I just yeah. felt lost in this sea of people. And so college was a big turning point for me. I think, um, you know, a lot of people go off to college and they sort of lose their minds. I definitely did. But I think I lost it in an interesting way because my parents, because they were so hippie, liberal, um, my parents were the ones, I mean, nobody would ever do this now. Well, maybe they do, but my parents were the ones like, we know you're going to drink and we know you're going to smoke weed and we know you're going to do all these things. So do it at the house so that we know you're safe. So my friends all wanted to come hang out at my house and like get drunk with my parents. And my way of rebelling against that was to be like Sally straight edge. Like I never did anything <laughs> in high school. I was just, you know, I did my studies. Yeah, and I actually yeah. totally judged my friends cause they wanted to come over and get high with my parents. You know, it's just, <laughs> it was just how it kind of rolled and I didn't know any different. Yeah. And, um, so I went off to college and sort of lost my mind cause I finally was, Oh, I yeah. think I'm going to drink a whole bunch of stuff and yeah. try all the things. And um, so college, but college was great for me. I wound up being a transfer student because of that, that semester being kind of messed up. And so I came in as a student during new student orientation and didn't have the normal, like your roommate. My roommate was coming three days later because the older students came in after new student orientation. Yeah. So it, I felt sort of in that place again of like, great, I'm here by myself and I have to figure this out and I have to make friends. And of course I didn't know anybody that had gone to this weird school in Iowa. Right. And I make friends with a handful of people who watch my dad carry up milk crates that I've stolen from some grocery store over the years of CDs. I was the hoarder, totally music hoarder. Again, studies and sort of music. Those were the things that I always kind of buried myself in because Uh nobody could take away my Walkman and nobody could, you know, make me not study. And those could be consistent no matter where we were. Yeah. Other than the whole weird Motley Crue thing that was happening (laughs) in school. Um, and so I sort of found this group of people that were really into music in college. And one of my friends, there was a radio station on campus and she really wanted to be a DJ. Like her life goal was to be a disc jockey. 
And I didn't know that was a job you could have, right. you know? So I'm like, that sounds amazing. I don't want to talk. I don't want to be anywhere near the stuff, but I have all these CDs. So let's pitch a show. And so we wound up getting a, a show on the, you know, the hundred watt station at our campus or whatever. I think it was a thousand actually, but still. Um, and I loved it. My friend dropped out after a year or so. She didn't, it wasn't really her thing. Yeah. And cause it's work. Yeah. Gotta, and I think it wasn't, up. yeah, it wasn't, wasn't what she was into. Yeah. And so I just love the music. And at the time it seems so funny and cliche now, but nobody was doing it then. It, this was, I started college. I started at least in Grinnell in 1990 and um, nobody was doing 80s, like an 80s theme. And, you know, in, in college radio, for a lot of colleges, everybody wants the cool alternative show. And, and the way they set ours up was you had to pitch for a show, and then they would find a slot for you and whatever. And so we pitched for an 80s alternative show, and then that wound up being something that I did for the whole time that I was at college and played the college parties. and Because I was better at sort of... DJing the parties than I was at going to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it gives you a reason to be there. Yeah. Well, and I just, you know, other than drinking heavily through college, yeah. I wasn't the most social person on earth. I mean, I had a very small group of friends that I was super close with. Yeah. But other than that, I didn't do a lot. And because it was a liberal arts school in a very small town, it wasn't like you would go out into town and do anything else. We, yeah. You know, they would play movies on campus and they would do all those things. It was really a residential right. situation. So I just didn't go anywhere. Yeah. But I also worked at, I had like three jobs while I was in college. And I think that was one of those other moments where I'm like, oh yeah, we don't necessarily have what other kids have. And I've gone to this expensive school that I've decided to go to. And I have to work at the dining hall and I have to work at the hy V in town and I have to work at the preschool. And, you know, just so that I could make the parent contribution <laughs> that to my parents was like, are you joking? Right. You know, I mean, it was just right. way too yeah, much just, money. Just not possible. Yeah. Or definitely not possible in one chunk. Yeah. You know, I feel like yeah, it was yeah, five yeah. or $6,000 and it was, you know, it was laughable at yeah. the time. So I leave college with, you know, also, that was a time where they would, they wanted every 18-year-old to sign up for credit cards. at all the credit oh, yeah. cards. They were all oh, maxed yeah. out. The only thing I ever did in town other than work at the hy V was I spent every dime. And I did, I mean, the day I turned 16, I went and got my first job. I was at the movie theater, standing there, ready to go. And I spent all of my money on music, always, my whole life. And my parents loved that because that, that was also how they bonded with me. I can remember getting... Uh, tape of The Cure, who is still to this day one of my all-time favorite bands. And my dad insisted on sitting in the kitchen with me in the dark and listening to the whole thing front to back, you know, front side of the cassette, back side of the cassette, because he wanted to understand what I liked so wow. much about it. Yeah, so it that's was, cool. It was awesome. That's cool. It's one of my favorite memories is that weird little kitchen in that weird little house. And it's funny, you know, you get older and you have lapses of memories of things, but that's one that, I mean, I can be back in that kitchen in a minute yeah. sitting with him. Like, yeah. Not understanding, I'm sure, what the hell I was listening to, but right. just loving it now, and vibing let me, it. Let me just ask you a question. When, yeah. when he said he wanted to do that, was that a oh shit moment or was that like, were you excited? No, I was very he, excited. Yeah. I was very excited. Because you, you got to show him something. Yes. You got to like share. Yeah, and they always loved music. My, my parents were 21 when they had me, so they were pretty young. Yeah. And by the time yeah, yeah, I yeah. was a teenager, you know, we weren't that far no, apart no, in age. No. So, you know, he was mid thirties yeah. and I was 15. Yeah. De so definitely can relate. Yeah. And he ages. was, yeah. you know, he's still trying to be cool and like know what's going on yeah. and I'm listening to whatever I'm listening to. And no, I loved it. I loved sharing music with, with my parents. That's they didn't cool. always get it, but yeah. I loved sharing it. And it was always something I loved. And when I went to college, I loved that, but I was a poli sci major. Um, I didn't know that political scientist wasn't a job. I mean, I had no idea what that was. I just knew that I was always math and science. Always, always, always. I, part of the reason that I had chosen Grinnell was that I, my dream was to go to Stanford and be Sally Ride. That's what I wanted. Okay. That's where she went. That's where I wanted to go. Okay. I wanted to be an aerospace yeah. engineer. Yeah. Yeah. That is got what it. I wanted. And I got into Stanford, but I couldn't even afford to fly out to yeah, see the campus, no, much less get I mean, in. And that's a place where people write checks, right? And like, right. good on you. Right. My family couldn't do that. Yeah. And so we wound up, Grinnell has a pretty amazing financial aid program, always has. And so I wound up with everything covered. It didn't mean that I didn't have loans, but everything was covered. Right. So I knew right. that I could get to school. And they had a 3-2 program at the time with Caltech. 
And so what I thought oh, no I was shit. gonna do was do three years at Grinnell, yeah. and then I was gonna go finish those last two years at Caltech and still do the aerospace engineering. Um, and then I was in, I think it was differential equations. And it was the first time in my life I could not, and this, and math was also something that I totally uh, like glommed onto my dad. Like yeah. that was one of our bonding things was he was a super math nerd. And um, I couldn't wrap my brain around it, the concepts. I couldn't understand it. Yeah. And it was the first, I mean, this sounds ridiculous because whatever, but it was the first C I'd ever gotten in my life. Wow. And I was gutted. Wow. I mean, I was just like, I didn't know what to do. Right. I thought everything's coming crashing. And it was the same semester that I had poli sci 101. So that's probably what led me there is that I loved that professor. I loved everything about it. Yeah. And, you know, my parents, again, they're so, they were always so wonderful and supportive. And because they hadn't been through that process in the same way, like they just, they didn't, there weren't expectations other than this was the first step towards lawyer, doctor, or whatever. Right. So I don't think they cared what right. the degree was in. Um, so, you know, I became poli sci major and I finished college and on graduation, my parents come up and everyone's super proud. And I had gotten into grad school at American University in DC and I had a job set up with, um, Tom Harkin, who at the time was the Senator in Iowa. And yeah, I had done okay. an internship with him at Grinnell and, you know, much beloved Senator. Yeah, of course. So I, I had him. a, I had a job at the DC office set up. I was going to go <clears throat> study public policy in grad school and, you know, just keep going. Cause again, I didn't know what to do. I knew I didn't want to do Dr. Lawyer, but I was real good at school. And my parents were a little stressed that I wasn't Dr. Lawyer. So grad school was okay. They were okay with that. Yeah. So I go out to D.C. and I'm looking for a place to live. This is maybe like two months before graduation or something. And I laugh now because at the time I used it. I know it was an excuse, but I went. I was there for a night or something looking at like the housing units that they had. And there was a shooting and I freaked out that that was like a sign that I couldn't possibly go there because it was super violent and whatever. I mean, so silly now to think about because it was just, some of it was having led a weirdly sheltered life, even when we lived in big cities um, and not knowing because Los Angeles is really the only big city we lived in. And I didn't know at the time, but one of the final cracking points for my parents to get out of LA was um, Richard Ramirez, the night stalker. Yeah, like yeah. that was pretty active at that time. And my mom was like, no, no, nope. done. We're going to go to the Midwest. These things don't happen in the Midwest. I mean, of, of course, course they, they do. do. But well, these uh, things don't I, happen I mean, in I mean, the Midwest. I mean, BTK, right? Yeah. Right. That guy was for 30, 40 years or yeah. something. Um, but that was one of the final pieces, I think, for them. It, so we sort of lived this weirdly sheltered life, even though we moved around a lot. We thought of ourselves as kind of open-minded and metropolitan. And yeah. so I think I just had an experience. And Grinnell, Iowa, which I had been in for the last four years. I mean, 1,600 population. Yeah. You know. And that's the school that's is school. 1,600 yeah, right. as well. So <laughs> tiny little place. Um, but I think any excuse at the time. So this is 93. And um, this is, sorry, this is going to be like no. the, the windy no, no, story, right? No, 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 right? no, 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 This is good. But it this all leads good. to why, yeah, why yeah, I'm doing yeah. this. So 93, um, very pivotal time in music that was going on. Yes. So instead of going to D.C., Washington, I moved to Seattle with my best friend from college. Mm -hmm. Her family had moved out there maybe in a year prior and she didn't know what to do after school, so she was going to go home, but yeah. home-ish. They were in Olympia. She was going to go to Seattle, and I'm like, that sounds good. Yeah. It's like, pack up the Ford Escort, and let's drive to Seattle. Uh, parents, not stoked about that. Sure. At all. Yeah. Um, because, because I had what's no plan. In Seattle? No plan. No plan, nothing except that, like, music's happening, and I'm excited about that, and I have a college degree. Right. I'm feeling myself right. at this point. I'm right. like, don't worry about it, Mom and Dad. I'm good. So... <laughs> I'm working at the mall at the Limited Express with my political science degree, because that's not a job I find out pretty quickly, <laughs> and no marketable skills whatsoever. And I'm, I, I'm there for not even a year, I think like 11 months. And I'm working at the mall and we're going to shows every night. So any dollars I have are being spent yeah. at, you know, bars and whatever. And of course, we're old enough to drink. Yeah. Seattle is the place for music in 1993 oh. going into 94. It's crazy. So it was insane. It was an amazing period of time. And I love that stuff so much. But I knew I had to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I really didn't know what I was going to do. And my roommate 
happened into one of these jobs through a temp a I mean, we both went to the temp agency. I get the job doing inventory at a hardware store, counting screws. Or I remember one of the, one of the temp jobs was asking people what their drink was at Starbucks. I still to this day am not a coffee drinker, so it was another language. I didn't even know what they were saying to me, and I had to write it down at 5.30 in the morning. Terrible. It was the worst. <laughs> it was the worst, worst. So she winds up doing pretty well, my roommate, so she can actually afford to go to all these shows that I'm just, you know, racking up on my credit cards or whatever. Yeah. We get 10, 11 months into it. I owe her $1,000. And at that time, it may have well have been $10 million. There right. was no way I was ever going to be able to pay her back. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to do, and I had to move home. And home at that time was still Joplin. Joplin was the longest my parents lived anywhere. So my sister was in high school. And I was gutted at the idea of having to go back to Joplin. Because I wrote that play. I hated it so much. I hated high school. I hated the small-mindedness of the people. It was the whitest place we'd ever lived. Like, everything about it was just not... I hated it. Yeah. And I didn't want to go back there. And it felt like a failure with... You know, yeah. and again, folks didn't make me feel like that, but I felt like I was letting them down and everyone. So it was terrible to have to move home. So I'm looking through the paper because I'm old and that's what we did then. And I'm looking for a it's job. 93. I know, right? Well, this is like 94. Launch. 94. Okay. We're Still. looking. <laughs> oh, I know. Still. There's no internet. Dude. There's none of that stuff. That doesn't exist. No. I'm looking through it's the Joplin universities. Globe so that I can find a job. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And the only thing I'm hoping for is like that I don't have to wear pantyhose or get up early. Like these are my only requirements in life at this point. And I wind up taking a couple temp jobs here and there. And of course, my parents are not thrilled about any of this. I'm also applying to grad schools because I don't know what else to do. And I wind up seeing an ad for a, a radio station that was an AM country station that needed somebody to run the board. So I'm thinking... Okay, this can't be the job job that I get, but if I can have something that makes me not want to kill everybody, that yeah. would be pretty great right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I go in and I take one of my college tapes. I still to this day have no idea, and I I owe I owe Mark Anderson everything. He hired me for some reason, and it was a be at the station at seven a.m. only on Sunday morning. I had to plug in a live church service broadcast sleep basically for two and a half hours and then unplug it and start the tape. And that was kind that of the, was the, that was that it. Was the gig. But I knew how to run the board. And so it worked. And then the gig turned into, I had a shift that I would do on Sundays. Yeah. I knew nothing about country music for sure. I mean, I, I was alternatine all the way and parents were everything from sort of like super sixties and seventies hard rock to, you know, my mom to this day, if I hear the stylistics, I feel like we have to clean the house because that's what we play. <laughs> that was the soundtrack to cleaning up every weekend. So all over the place with that. But I was like Miss Alternatine kind of thing. Yeah. And I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm playing. I don't know anything about it, but I figure out that hey, I can do the same kinds of things I did in college, just kind of fake my way through it. And I wound up loving it. And I want to say that minimum wage in Missouri at the time was three thirty-five or something. I mean, I was making nothing. And my parents were, again, not super excited that I was living at home and making three bucks an hour. But I loved it. And um, the station actually had a sister station on the FM side that was a light rock station. And that was, you know, that was the big dream was because they were on FM. Yeah. And so I work at the country station for not, not long, actually. I think they knew I didn't know anything about country music. Maybe eight months, nine months. And then I wound up getting a job on the other side. And so I, was, I did a midday shift at the radio station and got to help put the music together. And so I learned all this stuff about that industry. Yeah. Never once ever, other than having a blast with it, thinking it could be a job. Because again, I come from this background of not having any connections with people. You haven't that said did anything jobs. about the music industry yet. Nothing. No. So like, you know, you no, did a college I had radio no thing. Idea. You love music and you did a couple of It was always shows. something I loved That's and it was it. fun. Yeah. I didn't know there was an industry. Honestly, I didn't know that people had jobs like that. Right. I mean, you know, intellectually, you know, somebody's talking to you when you turn yeah. the radio on and radio was a In huge radio, deal. Yeah. It was yeah. everything That's when right. we were young. But I didn't know that that was a thing you could do. And I definitely didn't know how you did that. So I felt lucky that I had kind of lucked into this gig. And it was owned by, it was like a little mom and pop station owned by this couple. And they were lovely to me. And I wound up doing this light rock shift for a couple of years. And I was really enjoying it. But again, sort of, it didn't feel 
professional, it didn't feel important enough okay. for having spent all this money to go to college. Yeah. And so I decided that I'm going to go to graduate school, but I'm going to tweak studies because I'm really good at school and I can figure something out, but how can I incorporate music? Because now I realize that I really like this. Is there a way to make this a job? That is something more intellectual, of course, than a DJ, because at the time I was feeling <laughs> real snooty about that, <laughs> even though it was paying me. Yeah, yeah. So... I go to grad school at Mizzou, University of Missouri, because they had an amazing, still do, a great journalism school. So I'm thinking, okay, what if I take my political science background, I go study journalism, and I figure out how to be the political writer for Rolling Stone. This okay. was really what, in my head, it was William Greeter. I'm like, I'm going to be that. And they also had a really great internship program with Rolling Stone. So I thought, okay, if I'm at a big company, maybe my parents won't kill me if I'm writing about music yeah. or politics or whatever it is. And so I go to grad school and I have to have 17 jobs because that's how we roll and take out all the loans because, again, didn't learn great money lessons from my folks. Um, so take out all the loans and I'm working three jobs and I wound up getting a job at a radio station and it was an alternative station. So I was in heaven okay. musically. I'm okay. thinking, I'll now, just do this on the weekends. Now we're talking, yeah. And... I'm just going to enjoy this while I'm doing my studies and all of that. And I'm a TA and all the things you have to do as a graduate student. And the weekend job turns into the morning show. And I do the morning. I wind up doing the morning show at this alternative station for a few years. And I loved it. I really loved it. And, and we were, it was a college town and we were the only alternative station. So it was also a little bit, it was a little bit of like, big fish, small pond kind of yeah, thing, sure, you know, like sure. I never paid for drinks or meals yeah, or I was yeah. like, you know, a little mini rock star in, in Columbia, Missouri, and I could go to things for free. And, um, my TA students thought it was really weird that they listened to me in the morning show and a montage of people calling me a bitch to open my show. And then I'd come <laughs> in and be like, okay guys, you know, it was weird. Um, but I think that was when I started reading the trade magazines and things that I didn't know existed. Because at the little mom and pop one, I didn't really know what any of that was. Right. I didn't know sort of the industry behind it. And at this station, even though it was even smaller and owned by an even smaller group, they were definitely people who were there doing this and this was their profession. Yeah. And I think it was the first time I realized that I could make this a profession, but I was going to have to really figure out how to work hard to make sure that my parents thought that it was legit as a job. Yes. Um, because it was something fun to do and not a career. Yes. And I think that, that was the turning point for me where I'm like, well, it could be a career. I don't know how to make it a career, but it could be a career. Yeah. And so I did that for a few years and I learned everything that I could from the teams that were around me. And also learned the unfortunate side of the industry at, there as a woman, um, which was the, the owners and the way it was set up, super, super, super sexist. You mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. one dude that owned it, kind of a redneck, like in, in the actual like definition of that at the time. And um, we were, I had been part of a duo for the morning show always when I was there. Um, and you know, radio, unfortunately there's still a lot of this, but at the time, particularly for women, it was either you were the giggle box on the morning show or you could do the midday and that was about it. There weren't any other jobs. Mm -hmm. And so if there was more than one woman at a station, they were really super competitive with each other and awful. And, and I experienced all of that. But the worst of it was I, one of my, um, partners moved on and we were finding another partner for the morning show and he moved on kind of without any notice. And so I was doing it by myself. And at the time in that local market, I was beating Bob and Tom, which was a syndicated show. I was doing really well, but I didn't have enough, um, kind of confidence. And again, this being a career yeah. or me knowing what I was doing yeah. to know that I could stick up for myself. And so I went in and we were having a conversation about some of the candidates and because I was part of the crew that was actually bringing in the candidates and interviewing them, I knew what the salary was and it was almost triple what I was making. And so I asked the owner for a raise and I remember the, I mean, I must have fretted over that for a week. I was so, so much anxiety. And I think I was making $11,000 or something. I mean, I was making nothing mm -hmm. annually. And I was, you know, 14 jobs doing the, the, I was the assistant program director and the music director and all these things. So I go in and I tell him that. And he's like, well, unless you grew a penis overnight, you're not going to make any more money than you're making Holy now. Holy shit. Like that, that blatant. And I was just like, wow. I, it's funny because now I would have 25 responses for that. But in the moment yeah, then. No, of course. I didn't know you could when, even when, say something like yeah, that. Yeah, right. I was shocked. 
And I didn't know what to say. And I'm not even sure I knew how wrong it was. I mean, I knew it felt wrong, but I didn't know that you could like push back on somebody for saying yeah. stupid crap like yeah. that. So I didn't push back. Wow. And I freaked out and I thought, okay, well, I can't, I can't stay here. I can't like... I knew I couldn't put up with it, but also, and this is the dilemma, I think, especially for young women, my choice at that point in a town of that size was to completely leave radio and not have a job in my industry or, and not pay rent or put up with it. So I put up with it after that until I could figure out what my plan was. And we wind up bringing in this guy and he was lovely. I mean, he wasn't the problem. It was really just the, the ownership. But it was just so depressing and so sad. And I think that part of it, too, made me feel like, oh, well, don't you – you know, I grew up in a, in a, with a family that is, like, super blue collar. And so you work hard, you advance, and you – you know, people reward that. And none of that was happening. And I couldn't figure out what, what I had done wrong. And I just thought, this is just a crazy kind of job. And they're never going to respect me or something. But I really didn't know what I was – thinking so this is this is truth at the time working at the radio station making eleven twelve thousand dollars a year was not enough money believe it or not to live off of <laughs> and um and my now husband who was a tow truck driver was making you know 10 times what I was making probably so he was paying for everything and I was working part-time at a porn store because the porn store was the biggest... Are these the revelations that you're talking about, Marcus? The porn <laughs> store was our biggest um, uh, sponsor at the radio station. Get out because, of here. Because, you know, who's the porn store going to talk to? They're going to talk to the alternative station with all the college yeah, kids. Yeah, of course. So we had done a couple oh of like gosh. live remote funny things from the porn store. And I loved the owners. Like The owners were just great. And, you know, we would laugh or whatever. And then I went in and I'm like, hey do you need extra employees? Cause I need extra money and I'm, I'm not afraid of this. I'm so open-minded. Or whatever. I totally thought I was open-minded until I worked at that porn store for a while. And so I'm making probably as much money part-time at the porn store as I am at the radio station yeah. and hiding. I, I just, I can't it's the stories. It's the best people watching you will ever have <laughs> in your life until, until your, uh, grad school advisor comes in <laughs> <laughs> not my advisor actually it was it's but it was somebody actually it was somebody that i ta'd for Ugh. came in and so i hide down between the behind the counter because i don't want him to be embarrassed yeah, or whatever right, right. and i don't actually care and then he's like buying stuff it's just awkward right like terrible terribly awkward and but also a fun funny job things yeah. that you don't think about right like you have to put batteries and things and test it because you don't you're not bringing it you're not bringing it back so we had to turn everything on you know think about that just think about it yep, um, that works yeah so <laughs> so you and you would embarrass the crap out of people coming in because also it was a big big fraternity <laughs> sorority school so there was a lot of hazing that had to do with the porn yeah, store and sure, whatever sense, so yeah. you have this you know five foot two tiny little woman walking in there to buy this like giant It was called the BAM. I'm not kidding. It was like a giant (laughs) dildo that they had to buy. And I could always tell when it was Hell Week or whatever. You'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Guess what? I got to put batteries in that. (laughs) So you're just like turning colors and, you know, it was a fun job. It was a fun job. But in the meantime, because the radio station, all that stuff was so awful, I was trying to actively find my next job. And I was looking in, at this point, I had moved up from newspapers to the trade magazine. So, because um, the internet was still real new yeah, in the late 90s. Yeah, still not happening. No, especially not for job searches. And um, working at the porn store, looking every day for new <laughs> jobs. And I come across a, um, two jobs that look pretty interesting. One is in San Francisco, and it's a streaming radio product. And I don't know what any of those words mean, except San Francisco, and that sounds awesome. And then another was um, in Charlotte, North Carolina for morning show. So I applied to both of these jobs and I wind up getting interviews at both of them. And, you know, I sort of knew what the Charlotte thing was and and it was, I thought it was pretty exciting because it was a step up on the, the market size and all of that. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that Yeah, and that gets pretty far, but I'm really excited about this weird thing in San Francisco because they're going to fly me out to San Francisco for an interview. So again, I'm feeling myself, I'm showing up and you know, they're picking me up at the airport and I'm going in. I don't know what this is. This is spinner.com and didn't have a clue. 
didn't even have strong enough internet to figure out what it was before I went into the interview. I remember thinking that I couldn't, I had tried to get on the website and I couldn't get on the website. <laughs> I can't believe any of these people, people hire even, me over people the years. Even, like remember what that was like? Oh no, no, the yeah. dial-up like right. yeah, I yeah. couldn't get to Everyone was back then. Yeah, yeah. Oh so, my gosh. So I go out and I do this interview. Months go by, months, and I'm trying to follow up in my and again, remember, n- internet isn't the thing that it is now. Yeah, so the no. follow up is calling right and maybe right. one email that you send yeah. right because nobody's sending emails the no. way we do now yeah and I'm trying to not be obnoxious but also really want it and what I find out later I didn't know at the time is that the reason it was taking so long and that they weren't getting back to me is they were being acquired by AOL in that period of time yeah and so I just thought we're done that's right. all there is to it remember because there is no email the same way there is now when they call to offer me the job, they call the house. My now lovely husband gives him the phone number where I am at work at the porn oh store. My gosh. So they call me at the porn store. I don't think they knew it because, you know, it was called the Old Dunn Theater. That doesn't sound that obnoxious. Um, hopefully we didn't have a stripper in there that day or something. I don't, I don't know. I just know they called me at the porn store to offer me the job. <laughs> and I'm ecstatic because it means that I can go in and quit on the spot right. to the asshole manager at the radio station. And, um, which I have never been actually, I had quit slightly before that. Cause I had sort of had it and felt like I couldn't put up with it. And I was making enough at the porn store that it was fine. Um, so they offered me this job. I still have the offer letter to this day because it was $40,000 in 1999 in San Francisco. So I'm thinking that's it out of here. See your boyfriend. Yes packing up the car, driving to California, hope you come later, out of here. And I moved to California. (laughs) And so this table, I would say, was about $2,500 a month in San Francisco in 1999. (laughs) (laughs) Super rude awakening when I get to San Francisco because that was the first dot-com bubble. Like just crazy. Everything's super expensive. I've somehow in my mad negotiation skills have gotten two weeks at a B and B near the office and to find something. Wow. I won't even have a paycheck within that two weeks. So I don't know what I'm thinking. I've got no money from Missouri because I was like eating off the free tab at the bars downtown and taking home my, you know, $180 paycheck or whatever. (laughs) Driving a Ford Tempo that doesn't lock. Uh, on one side, you uh, know, the office is in the mission, which at the time, you know, everything was being gentrified. And, and San Francisco yeah, what, what, is also yeah, an interesting... What, what, was, what was the mission like back then? It was an interesting place because everything in San Francisco, it's there, at least at the time, it's not like, oh, this neighborhood's bad and this neighborhood's yeah, no, fine. No, no, no. It was more, this block is really great and it's all these million dollar live work lofts that yep. are popping up for all the dot-com millionaires. And then around the corner is the needle exchange. Yeah, and right. it's always been that Still kind of that a city. Way. Yeah. Still that the mission was definitely a lot of that, but yeah. gentrifying. And so it was right at the beginning of really pushing out everyone that had lived there for so long. And I didn't know what that was. Did you even and know what gentrification so, was? No, right. I don't think I understood it until several years in San Francisco where I realized that all these amazing little taquerias and stuff were going away and Starbucks was coming in and places that, you know, there definitely was, Hey, that street, maybe when you go out at night by yourself, take somebody with you, that's maybe not the best place. And it just, everybody was being pushed out of their homes and because of companies like ours, but I didn't understand any of that, you know, and I'm 26 or something at the time. And I'm super excited to be there, but I did. I showed up with my car and it didn't lock and I lost a whole bunch of stuff that first week because of that. Um, cause it was, it was parked in a not amazing place and yeah. I couldn't park it at the B and B because that cost an extra than what I had negotiated and I couldn't afford it. Um, so then I spent, and I was grateful that my sister lived in Sacramento. So at okay. least when I first moved there on the weekends, it's I could drive to Sacramento yeah. and I could stay there so that I wasn't paying for the, yeah. you know, the weekends, yeah. but I was staying at like motel sixes. So what is your job at Spinner? Uh, so I was hired as the alternative Zarina at the time. That was my title okay. on my business card. And it was to program, um, and I have to be careful with that because the words mean different things now. It yeah. was editorial placement of music 
on their streaming radio product. Got now, it. this was before DMCA, yeah. before any of that. So we were, I had a front row seat for all of the compliance stuff that was going on, all of the legal stuff. AOL was very heavy in that entire negotiation, all the DMCA yeah. stuff. So it was I mean, I mean, pretty I think, fascinating. I, mean, I think it's also just important. A lot of the people who are listening to this will know this, but like at that time, AOL was basically the internet. Uh, it was the only thing. It was the internet. Yeah. Like that the was The only it. thing, it, Netsca Netscape was also part of AOL and in our building yeah. and part of what we did, but that was like the cool kids internet, like yeah. the nerdy people that had figured it out before the, the rest of us. people. It was AOL. You were using AOL. It period. was the biggest thing. Yes. Yeah. So they came in and they acquired Spinner and we were going to be the entertainment hub now yeah. for AOL. But everything else AOL was based in, um, oh no, I don't remember, in Virginia because yeah, they were, yeah, they were yeah, an East yeah. Coast company. And so... Yeah, Northern Virginia. Yes. And mm -hmm. by the time I got there, I remember the very first day I started, AOL did the merger with Time Warner. And wow. The you were stock, there like right then. Right that day. That day was my first wow. day of work. And I remember everybody coming up to me and I had no idea when I did the whole deal with them. I got like the whole world just yeah, collided when yes. that happened. Yes. And I got stock options Ugh. as part of my offer. I'm rich, bitch. I had no idea what a stock <laughs> option was. And remember, no internet in the same way. So it wasn't as easy to figure out what stock options meant. And so I was trying to just act like I did. I mean, I didn't even have health insurance at the radio station. Yeah. I had nothing. There were yeah. no benefits. It wasn't a big company. So I have health insurance and dental and all these things and stock options. And I don't know what that means. And so I try without looking like an idiot to kind of ask questions here and there and figure out what it means. And everybody thought I was so lucky because the day that I started for my strike price on the stock options was the day of the merger, which meant everything plummeted. Yeah. So they were like, wow, you're the luckiest person in the company because your stock options are just going to go through the roof because your strike price is so low yeah. compared to the rest of us. Yeah. So I'm, I, again, no clue yeah, what any right, of this means. Right. And I'm there for four years as the rock czarina, and um, part of what I have to do is basically program radio stations. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. And they wanted people from radio background, and my weird 80s alternative show in college is what got me that job, because they were thinking about radio in niche programming versus how terrestrial radio was being programmed and that was the thing that actually got me the job yeah so I get in there and I start and I'm rocking alternative and I do these stations and then that grows into all kinds of stations and by the end of it I mean we had 500 stations and there were 10 of us that were full-time editorial that were programming these things and I mean again the wild west at this time we had weekly trips to the amoeba to buy all the new music so that we could bring it back encode it into yeah. a format that we could get that we could then program it on these stations. So we had people that sat all yeah. day. There's no digital supply inputting, chain. No. So I'm completely convinced that we are the beginning of all the shit metadata that the entire music industry <laughs> is dealing with is that like our interns that were sitting there all day plugging in CDs from Amoeba. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and just putting whatever, whatever. They, whatever. And, you know, we had a system of you could rate it a song from one to five and all of these things. And so... What happens along the way is that this was started by music lovers, but we really are a tech company. And I keep having these conversations with them where I'm like, so I have this station, this 90s alternative station, and I love the way I've programmed it, but I want Nirvana to play twice as much as Green Day. And I can't do that with the tools that we have. And so I wind up sitting down with the engineering team and having these conversations and realizing that we just speak different languages, literally. And so they're building these great tools, but they don't necessarily work for how we need them to work because they don't understand our side of it. Right. So I spend a whole bunch of time mm -hmm. sitting down with these engineers and, and figuring out, basically stealing. I mean, it's funny now, but I basically stole from radio and the tools that they had to sort of figure out, oh, let's find a way to give weights to every single song that we add to a playlist so that we can play Nirvana twice as much as Green Day. And so we wind up creating this tool that I get two patents for down the line. I didn't know this for many, many years. But I also figure out that I have this kind of weird skill for interpreting mm -hmm. with the engineering teams. Mm -hmm. So I wind up being this kind of weird liaison helping the editors explain to the engineers what they need. So that winds up being something that I do again and again. But at, at AOL, uh, you know, at the time it was really groundbreaking again. So I, le so 
AOL decides they bought the San Francisco company. They don't really want it to be in San Francisco. They want everything to come to the East Coast. And so they start um, moving and or laying people off. And by the time you get to the fourth or fifth layoff in corporate like that, you're sort of hoping you're next because yeah, right. it's so awful yeah. to watch your friends get blown out and you're sitting there. And so it comes down to kind of the, the last round or whatever. And I think I, I am in San Francisco. I'm paying $2,500 a month for this table. Like I'm screwed if I lose my job. <laughs> um, and I have to figure something else out. And the weird sort of like small world of this industry is that there was a guy that I had met. No, I didn't know him well, but I had met him a few times in radio in Columbia, Missouri. He was in St. Louis. Okay. And he calls me because he knows who I am. And the world of digital music at the time is very small, yeah. very small. Because even at Spinner, the labels didn't have people that were dedicated to talking to us. We would just kind of chase people down and ask them about new music because right. we were just trying to get you're, the CDs you're so we didn't to have to make buy this them. Thing happen. Like, <laughs> yes. this is not radio no, it's not still a thing. running the, ru- the world. It's nothing. We can't even get the music for free. Yeah. We are buying it at Amoeba. Right. We have a budget to buy the music because we can't get the labels to send it to us. Right. De- uh, much less encode it and right. send yeah. it to us, right? We just wanted physical. CDs to be sent and so I get a call from this guy and and he has just started working at Apple and he says we're starting this new product we need somebody that can come in and program and again program meaning editorial for rock and alternative do you know of anyone because it's a small world and I'm like I think I might Because we've, we're on round seven of layoffs, and I'm a little petrified. So I go down, and I meet with him, and I wind up getting this job at iTunes. And iTunes, the product itself, launched in April of 03. And iTunes, the store, or maybe that's when the store launched. It, the product had launched prior to that, sorry. Okay. The store launched in April of 03, and then I started in January of 04. Okay. So it was right at the beginning of the, of the store, and there were five people that were working on iTunes and uh, was brought in to do rock and alternative. And then over the years that morphed into running label relations, running the editorial team. Um, How fast did iTunes catch? It feels fast now, Yeah, but it really, it didn't feel fast then. Right. I mean, I worked there for three and a half, not quite four years, which I equate to dog years because it felt like I was there forever. And in that period of time, um, we went from nobody at the labels would really talk to us to single of the week, which was one of the things that I worked on uh, being highly coveted and yeah. then wanting to purchase it, which we didn't sell it or right. any of that. And, and by the time I left iTunes, it was the number one retailer of music. Wow. It had just passed Target, wow. I think. So it, it, when you look at the grand scheme of the music timeline, it's very short. Yeah. But at the time, it felt slow because we were just constant head against the wall trying to get labels to work with us and artists to understand it and all of that. And to not... And to be super naive as a music fanatic that what we were doing was really good and we were excited about it where we didn't know, a lot of us on the editorial side, that the industry thought we were destroying everything. We were destroying the industry Mm -hmm. because they didn't control it. And they hadn't controlled it for a while. And I knew that at at AOL because AOL also owned Nutella. And Nutella was basically the rogue version of Napster that was built kind of inside and Winamp Winamp was yeah. in, our, in our building. So all of that stuff, it was, it was a very different. So I knew that that was a thing. iPods had just come out yeah. so you could load up your music on that. And so I could see it, but I didn't realize that the industry hated the idea of this. I didn't realize how much Steve was fighting to even get it done. Cause in Steve's mind, it was very like albums are 9.99 and tracks are 99 cents period. We will have nothing other than that. I remember what a big deal that was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like him setting the price. Yes. Was like. And that was important to him because it was about being simple yeah. and, and straightforward. And you always knew what you were going to get. Yeah. And it wasn't all this all over the place kind of thing. And, right. you know, the labels had always controlled distribution. So they felt like they could continue to control that. And they would fight with Steve and they would fight the, you know, they sued their customer. All, the, all those things that were happening. It was all in this period of time from like. 2000 to 2005, six is just crazy. Whole industry's changing, distribution's changing. All the players don't know what to do, but they think they can still control it because they always have. And you know, the industry continues to be run by a certain generation of people that, especially then, were definitely not interested in even hearing about whatever the 25 year old in the corner was talking about that was an intern at the office or something. And so, 
it it did happen relatively quickly, but it was a long haul for us. It was very challenging to get people to understand yeah. what we were doing and that we were music lovers. That's why we were all the editorial team was gutted when we sort of realized how much the industry hated us. Yeah. Because we didn't come from that background. We came from like, we love the music. How great is it that now you can get the one song? How long had we all complained about buying a $20 or at the time $25 CD for one song? Right. You would get so mad because you'd save up in my world. You'd save up three weeks of babysitting yeah, to go buy get that. Yeah, one song yes. as if that was the single. Exactly. That was so it. So I look at this and go, great. Blue collar kid with very limited funds who wants to hear music and is buying stuff out of the back of the Spin magazine and at the store. I can only get the one song. I mean, I thought it was amazing. So I understood for, deeply from the consumer side why it was so appealing. I just didn't understand the industry enough to know why they would hate us because yeah. we didn't have you, you that. You hadn't been in the industry yet. No, no. I mean, technically, I think Spinner was, but we weren't treated like that. And we weren't liaising with yeah. the labels, really. Yeah. It was very little of that right. at the time. And who we were liaising with, they were just excited to send us their baby artists and send us music. So it was all really positive. Right. And I knew there was pushback on Nutella and Winamp because they were, again, they were in the same floor with yeah, us. Yeah, and, 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 and I don't remember Nutella very well, but I remember Winamp. And yeah. that was like rogue shit. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, that was not legitimate above board stuff. I loved Winamp. But like, it was amazing, it, it was, and neither was Nutella. Yeah, and and none of like, that was like this. And this was when Napster was really, that, that people was, were that was, saying the word Napster. That was, pir that yes. was piracy, like, yeah. bubbling up. You and know? I think people just... It was more about access. So I think on top of that, seeing what was built in iTunes, I thought was amazing because not only did you take what's already happening, you legitimized it. Yeah, totally. So I had nothing but positive yeah, like yeah. stars in my eyes. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I'm thankful for that because I think it's the only way that I could do the job that I did because it was a lot of evangelizing, but I believed in what we were doing and I believed in what Steve had built. Like to me, it made a lot of sense. And from a consumer perspective of somebody that bought music all the time, it made a ton of sense. I'm still paying off credit cards from college for buying music, right? <laughs> right like right. I'm excited about this. And so I loved that job and it changed a lot over the, the four years that I was there. But I also got to do things. I always laugh now that, that, and even this reference is dated, but that I was the Forrest Gump of digital music, that I was sort of in the right place at the right time because when we did iTunes and we would launch a store in Australia, I would go spend a month in Australia. I would help hire the team that was going to work on this, and then I would train them. I would line up artists for the for the launch of this. You know, Japan, Australia, all these places that now it would never happen that no, way. You know, I mean, no, but at the time no. they didn't have, it was very secret. So I would even go sit in the Australia Apple office and they didn't know that we were launching iTunes. I mean, it was just this crazy period of time and, you know, took Steve to a Coldplay show and all of these things that just are magic to think about now. Yeah. And I was just, it had to do with when I was there and, and what we were doing. And I felt so fortunate that I got to be there at that time, but it was a hard, grindy job. It was an environment that was used to having engineers and not music people. So they didn't know how to even structure our pay. Now, and this remind, remind you that, that even though AOL was the king of internet, Apple was the first time my parents had heard of what the company was. So they weren't scared for my livelihood yeah, anymore, right? right? So right, I have a real right. job at a real company yeah. and they're okay with that. They yeah. don't know what we do, yep. but they know that it's a real company. So. I like this had to work. I was excited about all of this and this environment though. They didn't know how to structure our pay because they only had tech levels, you know, and, and also just the mentality of that place is that if you're not happy, that's cool. There are 10 people lined up behind you that want your job. Totally. And even on the music side, that was the case, the especially as we got bigger. It yeah. is, it is. And so I had just never been in an environment like that. And, um, I think one of the things that saved me was that, time at AOL that I had spent with the engineers kind of understanding how to do that and how to talk to them because we ran into the same thing. We had Coldplay came in to play a record for us and three times the engineers knocked on the door and asked us to turn it down. And the whole time I'm thinking it's Coldplay. It's not, <laughs> you know, it's not Metallica. It's right. not. And just so embarrassed of like the, that this environment was yeah. so different. I mean, now it's so different course, than it was. I mean, but everyone understands this now, yeah, but, it, but, but then it, the, the learning curve. And we the, were annoying. We were annoying right. the engineers and they were writing these beautiful kernels of code and delivering us updates on our programming tools all the time. And then we would go sit with them and say, cool, we actually need to search for a music product on this parameter that you guys haven't thought of because you don't think of the music that way. Right. We don't just 
bring it in and put it up. You know, I mean, it was this combination, which still is interesting it's and still, problematic still a thing. of people and yes. tech, right? Yes. Algorithms and having editorial. I yes. mean, these things have to live together, but music and tech are full of egos, right? Like just their ego industries. The tech side, it comes from this place of sort of intellectual hubris and, and that. And I think on the music side, it's the history. Yeah. I mean, you could look somebody in the eyes and they can tell you, you signed, they signed Led Zeppelin. There's no counter to that, no. right? There's no, That's it. you can't say anything to that. So the, they just inherently can't speak to each other because they're both more important than the other right. one. And, right. you know. That's right. So it's always been a challenge. And I think at Apple, I was able to do a little more of that kind of weaving in and figuring out how to interpret so that we could get tools made that just worked for us, that we could keep going and keep the industry happy because they wanted to be able to search by genre or label or all these things now that seem so silly that were major engineering undertakings. And, and everything was built in a silo. So that was the other thing that was really hard is that when we launched podcasts, when we launched movies, when we launched all these other kinds of content, they were built as separate things they that then felt, couldn't cross. They felt like it too. Like, yes. Like as the user, yes. iTunes is the one Apple product that was just a monster. Yeah. Like, because they kept adding yes. onto but it. But they were all separated. Yeah. So we would sit and go, hey, as it turns out, <clears throat> um, you know, Friday has Ice Cube and we should have the Ice Cube albums on the same page right. as the How film pull- and no, no, engineer. No. They couldn't do it because right. they could not combine multiple products yeah. and, you know, just things now that seem so silly, but it was a major undertaking to make changes like that. Then. Yeah. And so it was a lot of navigating that and learning it and loving and hating it. Uh, uh, singles became such big business and the industry was so mad at us oh. that they wouldn't release the single ahead of the album. You had to get it as part of the album on Street Date and then we'd have those fights, which is, you know, it's so funny to think about these things now, but it was a battle. It was a battle. And so we didn't feel the love until right as I was leaving. <laughs> I feel like I left right as think people were actually being kind to us, but I had, I was burnt out. I was super burnt out and I worked, I didn't have a vacation the whole time I was there. I worked every night. Um, Also just on a personal level, when I had moved to San Francisco, when I finally got my permanent housing situation, it was a BART train away from my first job at Spinner. So I could take the train, no problem. When I got the job at Apple, it was in Cupertino, and so it was 45 miles each way in Bay Area traffic. So that also led to my mental demise. I mean, it was brutal. So I would leave a little bit later in the morning to try and avoid some of the traffic and then come home 8 o'clock and then sit there long enough to eat dinner and then work all through the night, all through the weekend, getting caught up on stuff. And and you talk about the boom of email. This was the boom of email because then all of a sudden we were popular. All the labels wanted to talk to us and no one communicated except in email. And so it was also just training yourself on a complete new way of communicating and making sure that you were staying on top of things. Yeah, and by the way, we didn't have... Uh, sort of all the common practices that we have now of, yeah. oh yeah, guess what? We're not answering emails over the weekend. Or no, like, you know, like Because no. we know it can ruin people's lives. This was like, none this, of that. This is why we created those practices yes. because like yeah. it actually did burn people it did. the fuck out. It was it totally burned out yeah. and no tools either. I yeah. mean, you sort of were just kind of figuring email, out what like, made yeah, sense for you. There was no send and... later. There was no... No. Yeah. I joke now because when I started when I started the company, when I started M Theory, I went through, I had a month where it was just me taking meetings and you know, that wasn't a full-time job yet, just taking meetings. Yeah. And so I put away all of the stuff in my office at home to try and, you know, how we, like the office is the junk room. And I had all the boxes from Apple still that I had not opened and I opened them up. I still have all of the notebooks where we voted on single of the week. All the editors would vote oh, and so cool. I have all the vote tallies, oh, all these crazy amazing. things, you know, that we would, we would be fighting over what was going to get on the, um, like the new music slider and what was going to get into the showcases and all these things at the time. And it's so funny to think about now because we didn't have tools in the beginning. We wound up building tools with the engineers over time yeah. where we could make a list, God forbid, like an automated spreadsheet that would tell us the new releases that were coming out, you know, all these crazy right. things that we had to, that we had to figure out. And, you know, as it got bigger and bigger, I think I just didn't, I loved it. I loved my job there so much. And I never thought about leaving. And I wound up getting um, kind of courted by a record label in New York. And I was never going to work at a record label. And I definitely was never going to live in New York. And so I made a list when they got really aggressive with me of all the things at Apple that were driving me crazy at the time. It was the 
not just emails on the weekends, but the expectation that you would answer them yeah. at three in the morning yep. or whatever. Yep. And so I made a list of all of these things and I sent it over to the guy that was, that was chasing after me on this. And they agreed to all of it and agreed to triple my salary. And I had a moment of, oh my God, again, kid who's never had any money, yeah, you know, family is... or anything. The number they put in front of me is insane. Because remember, especially, and things again have changed, as a music person at Apple in the beginning, they didn't know what to do with us. So yeah. even our salaries weren't commensurate with the rest of the industry. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> so it's like a triple. So I go into my boss's boss and basically said, we need an admin for our team because we're dying. And I would like a 10% raise. And here's what's being offered to me. And they said no. And I think it was the first time that I realized that, especially in corporate America, they just, they didn't care about me the way I cared about them. Yeah. I cared about that product and that team so deeply and it was really hard, but I did feel strong enough, confident enough to know, wow, I have to, I have to go. Yeah. I have to, I can't yeah. actually be okay with this. Nope. Plus it was like an NFL contract. It felt like at the time, I mean, I thought I was, you know, three years and all this money and and I moved to New York and I worked for a record label. It was all these things I wasn't going to do. And um, I think going into it, though. Now, what label? Uh, Motown and Republic, which at the time were a com consolidated yep. um, group. And just for context, what was going on at Motown and Republic? Well, Re I, went from, I went from um, the single of the week was Amy Winehouse when I left iTunes and Amy Winehouse was the first project I had when I got over to Republic and Motown. Wow. And I had to take Amy to Lollapalooza and have her meet with all of the partners. And it was like a weird first full circle thing. But on the Motown side, it was all cash money. So they had all of the cash money labels. So it was pre Drake and Nikki. This was all Little Wayne, but this was, you know, I was there for the Carter three. Yeah. Um, this baby called me every single day and asked me what his iTunes numbers were. And it was also this weird um, combination of that and a few rock bands. And then on the Republic side, they were very focused on Amy Winehouse, Jack Johnson, Colby Calais. They had had Three Doors Down and Godsmack for a long time. It's what they built on. Yeah. So it was this really interesting we, we, yeah, kind yeah, the of... The Republic side was Yeah, it was, all over, the, it was all over the yeah, place. Yeah, the Republic side was interesting. Totally all over the place. Yeah. And um, went in there. I still have this notebook, too. The very first day that I went in there, I was the head of, I was the head of digital marketing. And this is so embarrassing. I looked up the word marketing before I went in because I didn't know what the word meant. <laughs> From, like in a practical sense, I didn't know what it meant. I, I had been doing it. Yeah. But it was always editorial. Like it was always that kind of a thing. And so I just right. had never used, I had never used that term for what I did and I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know how I could be the head of it when I didn't know what it was. And so I have this notebook where I had written out the definition of marketing. And I went in and I had, I walked into a team of, I want to say that it was 13 or 14 or something. So it was like digital marketing, mobile, because of course we had cash money, we had Akon, we had Chameleon Air. We were yep. like the kings of ringtones. Yep, yep, and yep. we had a, a great mobile team. Um, and then there was some, it wound up being marketing and some digital sales stuff over the years. And, and I walked in and I interviewed all of the employees so that I could understand what they did and what their jobs were. And I mean, I took copious notes because I had no idea what any of this was. I definitely didn't know about mobile. I started that job second week of April or something and the iPhone came out the very first iPhone came out three weeks later so if you can remember what this was yeah, like we we're talking I, I about like razor phones I and, can absolutely remember so, exactly so what I'm now head like. of a department that I don't know what it is I don't know how it works I have no idea how I don't buy ringtones I'm probably the last person on earth that got a cell phone right and and I'm head of marketing and I don't know what I don't know what any of these things mean you know and so I think my one of the things I've learned over the years is that I've been better at keeping an open mind than I thought. Every single job I've had for the last 20 years didn't exist before I took it. Yeah. So I couldn't have plotted out what I was going to do on this. I, right. I couldn't have never gotten there. So I've always sort of been good at keeping an open mind. So I get there. I figure out what my job is eventually. And a, and a lot of it, you know, it was a weird, it was a weird point in time. It was, I got to have lunch quarterly with Doug Morris, who ran the whole company because he was obsessed with iTunes and obsessed with Steve and, you know, everything that was happening I mean, in digital. So I was lucky. Be. Yeah. So I was lucky because nobody at my level got to have that kind of regular it's conversation. Right. It I just mean, didn't happen. Yeah. Right. And we have these crazy conversations about people paying for 
fake cows in Farmville, and it, just weird, just weird. I mean, someday, someday yeah. I'll write about it. But very weird relationship now, there in now, conversations. Now, 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 was was he just super frustrated that things were headed this way? Yes, and feeling like like he like, wanted like, to hold it back. Yeah. He wanted to figure out how we kept this from yeah going any right, further. Right. You know, that, I, I mean, think that's what I would expect. I mean, that that was kind that's of what a, everybody that was thought. Essential music industry position. So that that's is not what like a everybody. Thing. That's no, like everybody that's in everybody. the music industry was like, how do we especially stop this at from that happening? time? Yeah, for sure. And remember, sure. this was also BitTorrent time. Yeah. So and having cash money, it was catastrophically devastating for the Carter three to get out in demo form Ooh. on the peer to peers, right? Like this was a big deal. This took money out of people's pockets at that time. Yep. And now you don't even think twice yeah, about it because people think about music with a completely different Can valuation. Can I ask you a question about that then? Yeah. Um, how, how did that, because Wayne was like so big on the mixtape yes. side of things. Yes. So how did this BitTorrent thing influence so mixtapes? It's it's amazing because we would have these conversations about how do you build your career off of free mixtapes and then try to harness it in and tell people that they have to give value to it when you've built everything off of the free right. mixtape culture. Right. And I, I don't know the answer except that I can tell you I was in the studio with Wayne when it leaked and he was gutted. I mean, gutted about it. And it wasn't because he didn't want to take advantage of that culture of mixtape yeah. and free. Yeah. He would have done that, honestly. Right. It was that the art got out there before it was finished. And in his mind, that was really awful. Because it was usually some producer or some kid in the studio that could get paid a ton of money from Worldstar or whatever yeah. and, and leak this stuff or from the BitTorrents. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, the incentive was there for them to do it and they didn't really care. And they also didn't think about it that way. And I think in the Carter Three was the one where I really saw that because Wayne was really upset when that leaked. And we still wound up doing a million first week, which was such a big deal at the time. Um, but it wasn't even that. I mean, it was more, no, it was, more it was like, a really interesting it was the, it was the art. change. It yeah. was the art for him. It was, it was totally the art. Because I think culturally he got it. And we, we struggled over that. And how do you build that up and then not give it away? Because it was still this mix of physical and digital. So you also still had to be able to sell CDs and DVDs and all of those things. And especially for hip hop, because it's such a different, um, especially then the live show wasn't that you weren't making no, money on the live no, show. No, no, you were no. making your money off of your IP. And so no. it did matter. Even yeah, I mean, though I mean, he we had, really didn't have, we hadn't hit festival times mm -mm. yet. I mean, like, no, not for hip hop. Anyway. No, not then. No, not then. I mean, I feel like Wayne broke a lot of those barriers, honestly, with, with that album and yeah. with the subsequent albums, but it was challenging for yeah. sure. And so you were, you were giving up your money. You weren't going to be out doing 80 shows a year and having that kind of a career. It just didn't happen that way. And so I think he was torn over how to build that and still have a career out of it, you know? And I yeah. think the way he kind of reconciled it over time was just that mentality of bringing as many people with him as he could. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I feel like cash money was great. Not the first, but one of the first along with 50 cent that were really about, my project is about whatever the next project is. And that, and it was this sort of like ladder that they had built. And it was genius from a marketing standpoint because it did still allow you, I think, to maintain that mixtape feel. Yeah. Because Wayne would be on three of the tracks from Tyga or whatever was happening, you know, at the time and, and kind of build that way. Yeah. And they wound up, you know, they were massive. They signed Drake and then they signed Nikki. And Nikki is one of the hardest working people I've ever met. I don't know now if that's the case. But then, I mean, she was on, she's so funny. She was on iTunes every day looking for um, uh, illegal versions because people were putting up mixtapes all the time and getting that stuff taken down, which was very entertaining. <laughs> so... That was, you know, it was a weird four years and I was an executive vice president. So I was really high up on the food chain, but not high up enough to actually have any decision-making power. So it was very frustrating. Yeah, yeah because decision-making power was centralized. Yeah. If, if you were not totally. the CEO at, totally. at a label, you didn't, you weren't really. No. Yeah. No, nobody yeah. really made decisions. Yeah. And it also wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't rational. There, there was a time that I went in, and because there were two labels at the time, there were two presidents and two vice presidents and whatever, and so when we would have an executive team meeting, there were six or seven of us mm -hmm. in there, and we were doing layoffs, and one of the times that we did the layoffs, it finally hit my team, and I thought, 
I run the digital team. How are we laying off anyone in digital? There's 7 million radio people. There's 7 million physical sales people. Yeah. What, what are we doing? And I said, you know, if everyone in this room would take a 1% pay cut, we wouldn't have to cut any of these people. And you would have thought I'd ask somebody for like their firstborn. I mean, it would, did not go over well. And, but it was true. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. you know, you guys are rolling up in Bentleys yeah. with a driver. And, you know, I'm sitting here with artists that have made a lot of money over their careers and can't afford to pay their mortgages. And, you know, it's frustrating, frustrating stuff. And I just, um, I knew, I knew from day one that that wasn't a long-term thing for me, but I got a lot out of it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot more about corporate America. I learned a lot more about how to manage teams because it was so different than iTunes. We were so like 10 people in the corner all doing the same job that we were huddled for safety and warmth yeah. versus I walked into this one inheriting a team and knowing that I'd probably have to make decisions on hiring and firing right away. So it was, it was, a, it was very formative for me um, growing as a, a manager. So I, I'm grateful for that. I also had one of my first mentors, which was, you know, it's funny because it's, it's, it's Mel Winter, who is one of the yeah. old school guys been around forever. But Mel was great. He just, he, first of all, he was the cash money whisperer and probably still is to this day. I've never seen anybody talk people out of or into things better than, than Mel could <laughs> with those guys. He just knew. He knew what motivated yeah. them. He knew like how to say it. He was just magic in that. And um, I just learned a lot. I learned patience from him because there were times along the way that, you know, the presidents might not get along or there was something going on. And, and I felt kind of like I was in the middle. Of, I was like child of the divorce. I didn't know where to kind of put my loyalties. And it was hard to be a shared service in the middle of that. And he was very calming and reassuring and also just had so much experience that I learned from and didn't have the ego that I think a lot of the executives in the industry have. And, and I appreciated that because there weren't a lot of. A lot of folks like that, Mm-mm, unfortunately. No, not in your industry. Still not a lot. And okay, then there is no way we're going to, because I know, I know what's still left. So I we're, know. We're going to have to do part two. Okay. We are, because also I have a phone, I have a conference call that I have to do at some point. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> pro- well, probably pretty soon. Here. I talk too much. But this is awesome. I, I, I honestly think we're going to do a part two. Okay. Let's do a part two. I, Nashville. We haven't even gotten to we fucking even gotten Nashville. Nashville. I know. Yeah. I'm old, Marcus. I'm yeah. old. And, you, and you've been here over 10 years. I have been here for 13 years. Yes. So, 10, 10 full time. Yes. Okay. We're doing a part two. Des, okay. we're doing a part two. Oh, so we have to. Sorry, okay. Des. We're doing, we're, we have to. Okay. We're doing a part two. And, <laughs> and, 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 we'll, and, we'll, and we won't... Uh, so part one is just like the weird story of Cameo before she gets to Nashville and does anything. Dude. dude. That was no, great. it's fucking awesome. Man. I am so sorry. I literally just like my phone was going yeah. off and I'm like, shit, I have a conference call in okay, five minutes. So, so we're probably going to come back in a couple of weeks with part two of this episode. And I know you all are like freaking out because you can't wait to hear the natural <laughs> piece. All right. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Okay. Peace. Thank you for watching this episode of the Creative Power Hour. Here on Marcus Whitney's Video Universe on YouTube. I need you to subscribe. Hit that button now. <laughs>